Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Let's see. This is the title, so you all know where you are. And thanks again, everyone, for coming to this event. I know you have a choice in, in the event that you attend, and I appreciate that you attended this one. Thank you to Jamf, and thank you to my team. We got some team members here in the front row, and uh, if it gets too technical in the q and I'll be bringing uh, one of them up on stage to answer questions. Um, <clears throat> I want to get started with a brief uh, history of our company so you know where we're coming from. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, quickly say that uh, I ran through this presentation with my family before I came here. And uh, my 13-year-old son said when it was done, Dad, uh, will people understand what you're talking about? And will it be less boring? And I said, go to your room, son, and stay there until I get back from the conference. Uh, but no, actually, uh, I don't talk to my son that way. I said, thank you for the feedback, and I gave him a hug. And on the way out the door, I remotely wiped his iPad. So uh, <laughs> we'll talk when I get back. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, a modern dad. I don't tell my kids to go to their room. And I'll be talking more about that in my presentation in just, just a little bit. But uh, Forget Computers, uh, I started Forget Computers in 1998. Uh, and, and supporting purely Macs, and everyone thought I was crazy because that, if you remember 1998, how many people here were born in 1998? Anyone? Okay, I, ne I need you to step outside because I'll use some language that may not be appropriate for you later in the talk. Um, but 1998, you know, Apple was not in a good spot, and but I was focused on uh, servicing the creative market, and I knew even if Apple died, the creative market would be around and they would be needing help, and so that's what I focused on, and we, we've since you know, expanded because Apple has expanded and that's been great. Uh, in the process, we were introduced to Casper in uh, 2007, is that right, 2007? And we really got going with it in 2008 and we've been running with it ever since. And in the process, we built this, this thing we call Robot Cloud, uh, which is hosted and, and managed and uh, augmented Casper Suite. So it goes beyond the Casper Suite and I'll show you a little bit about that here. Um, but we've been working on that, and Chad's our lead engineer on that, and, and if we have any technical questions later, he's gonna help me out on that. So, uh, oh, the last thing I forgot to mention, thanks again for everyone who, who contributed to the discussion uh, about this event that I started. Um, and in fact, the first person who responded to that discussion, who really kicked it off, Adam Codega. Did I say your name right? Is Adam here? Adam, you kicked off the discussion, you couldn't show up to the event. I was gonna give him a t-shirt, but uh, he, he needs to show up. So if anyone sees Adam, I know he's here. Uh, we'll, talk to, we'll talk later. Um, but I was asking, you know, what, what uh, system are people using? And uh, it, Fresh Service was mentioned. ServiceNow was mentioned uh, several times. Uh, Jira, Web Help Desk, and, and we use Zendesk. But um, before we used Zendesk, uh, we were just email. And how many people here don't have a true ticketing system, like a real ticketing system? Anyone? Okay, a couple. Um, you know, for a long time, I, I was hesitant to use a ticketing system because it wasn't very friendly looking. Uh, they were all very ugly, all very Windows-like, and I couldn't see why we needed one. But as we scaled uh, and we moved from, from email, we moved to Basecamp, and we used it, it, it sort of inappropriately. It was a it was a project management system, but we treated it like a ticketing system. But then we, we outgrew that and, and ultimately found Zendesk in, in 2009 and uh, have been using that ever since, and, and it's fantastic. And I, I think everyone should, if you don't have a ticketing system, definitely get one. And during this talk, although we use Zendesk, you know, you, you substitute, well, every time I say Zendesk, in your mind, substitute your ticketing system uh, and apply what I'm talking about to your system. Okay, so let's, let's talk about some, some context here. So, you know, if I'm up, standing up here talking about ticketing and we, we process about 10 tickets a day, you're gonna be like, yeah, so, so what? Um, but where, where do our tickets come from? Uh, we deal with about uh, 100 different offices and approximately 200, uh, I used to say end users, but I heard in a previous talk that's a bad word now. So I took that out and now we, we deal with friendly people eager to, eager to learn, call us often with help. Um, 
And, and the way that breaks down, because it's not just one, it's not, it's not like uh, IBM where they have, this is our company and this is what we do and these are our tickets. We, we have to deal with different types of, of environments. So some, some environments, they have no IT. We are the IT. So other environments, they have IT, but they may escalate to us. And lastly, we've got the robot cloud where it's like we're providing the tool, and, um, uh, but we're processing tickets for them through the tool as well. And then their IT department is taking it from there. So a lot of different scenarios, and this is approximately how it breaks down. And, and once again, just for context, most of what we do uh, for uh, outsource and supplemental is in Chicago. That's our professional services. And then RoboCloud is global. We have people all over the world using it. Uh, frankly, just because Jamf is all over the world, so thank you very much, Jamf. Um, so here's what our ticketing system uh, looks like, at least for Q 2015. And this is a benchmark score from Zendesk. So Zendesk says, what type of company are you? And we said, well, we're, according to the options you've given us, we're in IT services and consultancy. And they say, well, uh, Q1 of 2015, most of our people in that category process 273 tickets. And we process 6,722. Um, not quite as impressive as IBM. Uh, in fact, I, I ran the numbers, uh, and we processed over 47,000 tickets in 2014, which is 2% of IBM's 2.4 million. Um, now, IBM made 15.8 billion in net income last year, so if we could just make 2% of that, <laughs> we'd make $316 million. The, the takeaway from that is do not compare yourself to IBM. <laughs> you, you will cry yourself to sleep. So uh, if we go back in time uh, to, to, to where this really started, you know, where this talk is really leading to, uh, you can see this is our ticket breakdown for the first uh, quarter of 2013. And uh, we were processing about 1,700 tickets, and then it went to 1,900, not a big deal. Uh, and then these are the tickets compared to 2013, 2014. These are just via email. And it doesn't look too bad here. You know, we're, we're growing. We've got some more tickets. It's up. It's down. You know, it, it doesn't look too bad. But if we say, well, those are tickets via email, but let's look at tickets via automation. Because we are really getting into automation. Because we're like, hey, this is great. We can automate this. We don't need to. You know, we can do a lot more. Let's do it. Let's do it. And we start having uh, a growth uh, that was pretty significant. If we add all those tickets together, tickets created by our users, tickets created by automation, uh, we can see we went from you know, 5,400 to over 13,000 tickets in one year. And unfortunately, uh, we were not growing the company <laughs> as greatly as the, our tickets were growing. I mean, in fact, if I, if I grew the company 240%, that would be fantastic. But unfortunately, that was not the case. And we, we were having a problem because we were, we, were coming up with, we, we were coming up with all these great ideas. And at one point, I think it was Chad who said, no, we, we can't do that. And I, I was like, what? Well, why not? He said, well, we, we can't process any more tickets. I'm like, well, that's a problem. When did this happen? You know? And of course, we had the numbers all along, but when you're a small company, busy company, you can't always track that. And uh, I forgot to mention our company, we've got 12 people, um, but only nine full-time. And I would say, uh, due to field engineers and, and development and, and internal support, we only have, at the most, six um, full-time help desk people working the support desk and processing these tickets. Uh, and, and that's on a good day. I mean, you know, this week we've had half our team here. So we can't have uh, half our team here, part-timers, and, and, and six full-time people on staff. So um, I would say minimum we've got three to four people always on the desk. But So we had a problem, especially on Mondays when we come in to all this, these automated uh, tickets. And we just had to sh shovel through them, and it was not fun. So we really needed to, to do something about it. So I've got three tips, three takeaways uh, during this talk, because there's a lot of information. But tip number one is beware. Automation can, can get out of control. So if it can get out of control and it's such a pain, why, why do it, right? OK. Well, for us, uh, you know, it used to be we'd go on site all the time, but now we're, we're mostly remote. I imagine most of you are remote. So the client doesn't see us as often. So we have to uh, imagine how the client envisions us or views us or sees us. And one way is the, the interfaces that they use. And self-service, which we all have, is, is one of those interfaces. And then we built uh, two more for our use. 
We built support menu, which lives on the Mac or iOS, so they can easily contact us. It was kind of like a shortcut to replace all the sticky notes we were seeing around the office. You know, forget computers, phone number, email. Okay, rip those off and put a nice, clean interface with some helpful links. That's our support menu. And then we built a dashboard, which is a web interface, and the dashboard uses the Zendesk API to collect information and show it to our clients, because if you've ever shown your clients at JSS, they're just kind of like, yeah, I don't know what you're showing me. It's just a bunch of data and numbers. So Dashboard is for the customer, and Dashboard is for our Tier 1 support desk staff, which really, uh, they're not CCAs, they, they don't live in the JSS, uh, and they need information. And Dashboard is available, by the way, uh, commercial announcement, to anyone who has a JSS. So if you have a JSS and you want a really great dashboard, that GMF I know is still working on their own. But if you want one today, give, give, let me know. Um, but the, the other thing that we have, uh, which we call actions, uh, but they're really policies. They're, they're, the, they're the policies, the GMF policies, they're the automations. Uh, you know, that's a really powerful aspect of the service that we deliver. However, it's, it's really largely unseen by the user. They, they don't, it's, it's happening in the background. And because we're not on site as much and because we're doing this remotely and automated, we wanted a way to share with our customers, hey, you know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing some stuff for you. Because if, you, if you're not exposing that just a little bit, then they're kind of wondering, you know, what, what do you do for us these days? Because everything's running fine. I'm not having any problems. Um, so we thought, well, um, oh, and Briefly, this, I got ahead of myself, but this is some of the examples that we, we, we use for actions, you know, install software, the standard stuff, remove software, create accounts, and this is all stuff that, uh, that you've heard throughout the week that, uh, you know, and you know the Casper Suite can do. But uh, our idea was, well, if we take our actions and expose them, you know, can we turn them into uh, notifications? And if you look at Apple's documentation uh, from Noti Notification Center, you'll see that uh, notifications let you know what's up. And that's exactly what we were trying to do. We wanted to let our customers know what is up um, and so we could be more transparent. And we decided to do that uh, through our ticketing system uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, Zendesk had the API that enabled us to do that. But more importantly, uh, we got a couple benefits. From, whoa, whoa, we got a couple benefits from that. And I and the benefits are, yes, uh, historical reference. Uh, when we create these notifications, we tag it with a serial number. So at any time, I can search in Zendesk by the serial number and see all the historical notifications for that device. And that's very helpful if you're trying to troubleshoot or you just want to see, you know, has this problem happened before? Has it happened often? Uh, so that was uh, fantastic. And then automated reminders, which is really a feature of Zendesk, but I'm sure any ticketing system can do this. You notify a customer they don't uh, necessarily respond to it, right? Uh, so you want to remind them. And so we created autom autom um, automated reminders in Zendesk. And um, that was very ben beneficial. So let me give you, before I dive into the, how we got to this, I want to give you a couple examples so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the first one is self-service, which we all have and we all know. And um, one of the great things that uh, Chad created uh, was um, we've got internet speed test. Because we have people calling us and they're like, my internet's slow. And that's exactly how they sound. My internet's slow. And we say, well, you know, there's, slow is a relative word, so that's hard to troubleshoot. So why don't we run a speed test and see what the, what the numbers are. And um, when they run it, it, it produces the result, displays it to them and says, you know, is this acceptable or would you like to create a ticket? And if they say, yes, please create a ticket, it sends that information to our support desk so we know right away the user's having a problem. Here is the speed that they're getting on their computer. And we, we have a base to, to, to start with, right? I mean, there's still more work and investigation to be done. Or we may just say, you know, hey, sorry, that's the internet speed that you have and you're paying for and, and that's expected. Uh, so maybe there's another problem, right, to investigate. Um, the, some other examples, I'm going to give you three, um, but they all relate to this general goal of manual versus, versus modern. And 
Uh, I was thinking about this today when I was, when I was uh, talking about my son, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm a modern dad. I don't tell my son to go to his room. Uh, I, I think um, IT is, it has the old school dad way, which is the manual, and the new school modern way, which is uh, on the right. And I wonder if it's related to the fact that uh, there's still some, some old stodgy people in IT who, who are like my dad when I was growing up, He's, and they're stuck in the old manual way. So I, I'm seeing a, a move toward the younger generation and uh, towards, towards this new system, and, and I really like it, and I hope it, it continues. Um, but we talk a lot in our company about uh, old IT versus new IT, and we try very hard to be the new IT. But the first example of what we do through automation is malware. You know, malware uh, is out there, it's, it's growing, it, it's, uh, it's on the Mac. And does anyone, has anyone ever found malware and the user said, you know, I, I, think, I'd rather, I think I'd like to keep it. I kind of <laughs> like it. Don't just leave it, just leave it. No, no one's ever said that. So why, why ask? Just remove it, right? So discover it, remove it, and then just let them know, hey, FYI, uh, I realized you were surfing porn recently, and I discovered some issues on your machine. I fixed it for you. you know. Our tickets aren't that transparent, but wouldn't that be fun if they were? <laughs> uh, another example is Time Machine, which we, we are not uh, fans of in business. Uh, we, are crash, we are a crash plan shop, and we push crash plan extensively. But we had so many requests for Time Machine. Uh, we said, fine, you know, okay, well, you know, you, there's no way to track it, but let's give you a notification if it's not working. So when it's not working, we notify them and we give them some suggestions on how to fix it. And if they fix it, then we realize, hey, now it's working and we auto update the ticket. So we can do all that without interacting with Time Machine because every time we have to interact with Time Machine, we get grumpy and we, just, we try to sell them crash plans. So. And the last example is warranty. Um, a lot of people, they, they want to save a few bucks, and so there's, they say, well, I'll get the warranty before it expires, you know, extend it, because you can buy it up to the first year. Um, and so we would try to remind them of that, but sometimes we'd get really busy, and it was a manual process, very extensive, uh, very time-consuming process. And sometimes we would just wouldn't have time to do it, so we'd miss it. And now we automate that. So if, it's a, if, it's, if you can renew uh, AppleCare, we'll remind you, uh, the user, uh, or if it's just going out of warranty. Hey, FYI, your machine's now past warranty, three years old, and uh, maybe it's time to think about getting a new one. So the journey, how did we get to the, the part where we could do that type of stuff, and how did we leverage the JSS? And um, it, it starts with the goal of how do we present notifications to the customer. And in the beginning, this is the workflow that we used. Um, we used Recon, which everyone is using, right? Uh, we leveraged smart groups, which you all have access to. It's the easiest thing to do. And it would, smart groups would trigger an email. And then our, there's the smart group. And then uh, our support desk would process that email, turn it into a notification, and send it to the customer. And that works. It's better than nothing. I recommend you all do that today if you're not doing anything. Uh, however, we did, you know, have an issue with that. And the, the biggest issue we had was we wanted to get more information immediately. And the notifications look like this. Uh, I mean, there's information there, but it's not a lot of information. So we'd have to take that and process it and do some research and figure out, do we need to notify the client or not about this? You know, what's going on? So uh, we took out the smart groups and the, um, uh, we replace it with extension, extension attributes. And I'll show you that in just a minute, and using the mail command. And this is where it's going to get uh, scripty and a little more complex, and that's where Chad will answer questions at the end because I'm not the one that writes these scripts. Uh, but what this allowed us to do with an extension attribute in the mail command is create uh, a notification that was much more detailed. And all of our notifications have these basic components. You know, why? this alert, next steps, so the customer knows what they might want to do, including maybe you want to contact your IT department. Uh, the details, which is really not so much for the customer, unless they're really interested, it's more for us uh, to know where this is coming from. And as you can see at the bottom, the serial number, because that's how we can search through Zendesk for past notifications. 
So uh, if you, is anyone here uh, using extension attributes in this way? Okay, great, quite a few people. So if you're not, you can um, create an extension attribute and you can use the uh, script pop-up. Let's see, here it is. And you can write your script. And uh, obviously this is not the full script. This is not gonna give you <laughs> what you need, uh, but I did notice on Jamf Nation there's at least a starting point for, uh, it's called creating extension attributes populated by a custom script, and that's just a good place to start. So uh, I would start there or talk to a developer if you don't know how to do this type of stuff. Um, so this was great, this was a, a, a huge improvement for us. Um, however, we did have an issue, and that was sometimes the mail command for us would get stuck. Uh, and we get stuck on the Mac, right? So sometimes uh, we wouldn't know this until the Mac was restarted and then suddenly it would trigger off all these alerts that were like from the past month. And so that was kind of annoying. And uh, we wanted to fix that. And, and to be fair, maybe that's not an issue with the modern OS, but that was an issue for us in earlier OSs. So tip number two is verify. Uh, automation is fantastic, but if you think, hey, everything's great and nothing's happening, maybe it's because something's not working. And um, dashboard, which I talked about earlier, is, is often a verification for us because if something uh, stops working in the JSS, unless you're looking for that problem, you often don't realize it. So the dashboard sometimes will show us information that I'll say, hey, this looks like a problem, but I didn't see a notification. Oh, that's because it's not you know, the back end is not working properly, let's fix that. Okay, so what did we do next to fix that problem? Well, we decided to replace the mail command with curl, or actually I didn't, because I have no idea what curl is. Uh, Chad did. Uh, Chad, Chad uh, leveraged the Zendesk API and the curl commands to create uh, something a little more complex, and this is what it looks like. Once again, this is not a complete script. So don't try this at home. And, um, and meow, meow, meow is not Chad's password, so don't try to hack him. Or maybe it is, maybe you should change your password. So, however, uh, this, this worked uh, really well, but it, it's introduced a new problem for us, and that was one of scaling, uh, because we started creating these um, extension attributes. There we go. We started creating more and more of them. And uh, whenever we wanted to make a change, what did we have to do? We had to go into every extension attribute and make that change. So uh, Chad came up with the idea of, well, let's take all the common code that is in all of those extension attributes and let's uh, turn that into a local binary that lives on the computer. So we took the common code, created a binary, put it on the max, and now we treat that like our own little application so that when we want to produce an update, we can just push it out with Casper Suite and update the binary, and the binary gets updated across our entire fleet. Uh, this provided additional security. We didn't have you know, passwords in our extension attributes. It reduced the code that we had in the JSS, and of course, as I mentioned, we could push, push things out more easily. So that was a huge uh, improvement for us and there's the, the local binary. And uh, of course now we have an, an, another problem, uh, which we've had all along, it's just now it really needs to be solved, and that is that uh, our support desk is taking these notifications and manually processing them. We have to decide who should they go to. You know, ev even if we know the machine and we know who it should go to, the system doesn't know, so we have to take it copy and paste or redirect it or do something in Zendesk, maybe an, an additional Zendesk macro or something. And that's uh, taking up a, a lot of time. So we had previously created support menu, which was there just for informational use, but we said, well, why don't we put tickets in support menu? Why don't we allow our end users to not only uh, interact with us through support desk, but create new tickets? And this was huge for us because everyone today, everyone gets way too much email. And all of our tickets are going into an email box that 
you know, hey, we're not, we're not top on the list. And, unless it's a real problem that, that that person wants to get solved, we, our emails are not top of the list. So to get out, what we like to say is to rise, <clears throat> rise above the clutter of email and into support menu has been really great for us. So the user um, can now interact with us through, through this interface. And in addition to um, alerting them uh, through email, which we still do, we can alert them through notification centers. So they can get a little pop-up. Hey, there's been a response from our team. You know, would you like to reply? And they can reply right there if, if, they, if they want to. So what this ended up, for, uh, what happened for us is we now have the JSS, which knows the, um, the computer. And we don't, because we work with so many different environments, we don't have the um, benefit of a directory service that we can just tie everyone to and know immediately who owns every device. So we have to come up with creative ways. So the JSS knows the computer. The local binary can send to any, any address, whether it's an email address or a, a, a support desk system, ticketing system. Um, and then Zendesk, or a support menu, now knows the user. So when we add all that together, we get, let me see if I can time this right. We get the happy dance. <laughs> Where's Blaine Matson? See here? Because Blaine, that was the cue to bring out the Jamp Solid Gold dancers on stage with me. And I'm a little embarrassed that I was the only one dancing. We were going to have a flash mob and everything. But no, the help desk, our help desk was very happy that we could now uh, automate this process. And uh, that allowed us to, to turn our workflow into this, which is a lot more streamlined. And it allowed us to deliver to any customer, uh, not just within our own environment, but now to any Zendesk, for anyone who comes to us with their own Zendesk, we can deliver directly to your Zendesk, uh, or to any email address, meaning the local binary says, is there a local user, yes or no, or should I deliver to a, a, a Zendesk, and then they can process it there, or should I just deliver it to an email address, and it can go to you know, ServiceNow or JIRA or anything like that. And uh, we're investigating, uh, looking at, uh, in the future, uh, integrating with other systems because the process is, is all there. And if anyone you know, on the list, ServiceNow, Web Help Desk, has worked with those APIs and would like to work with us on developing this further, please reach out to me. It'd be fantastic to collaborate and do that. So the examples I talked about earlier uh, with Time Machine, Malware Detection, Apple Care, this is how it's all being delivered now without us touching it at all, which is which is really nice. So the last problem, well, they're, they're, you're always going to find new problems, right? But one of the last big problems for us was one of timing. We, we were still relying on uh, recon. And recon you know, happens periodically. For us, it happens once a day. I think by default, it's once a week if you don't change it. So, and you could have it run more often, but you may run into issues if you're reconning too often. So um, recon. You know, if it only runs 24 hours a day and you've got a server hard drive that just filled up and you don't learn about it until 24 hours later, it might be too late. So it'd be nice if you could learn about it sooner. So once again, uh, I said to Chad, let's use LaunchD. Now actually, Chad came to me and said, uh, there's this thing called LaunchD. And uh, so he, he took out, he, he put LaunchD uh, scripts on the machine. And what this allowed us to do is to, to time our notifications based on the extension attribute or what we're trying to get. So we may want to know every minute. We may want to know every hour. We may want to know every day or not. You know, we have the flexibility now to trigger uh, what we need to know at the time we need to know. And if we find a problem, talks to the local binary, updates Zendesk, goes to the user, we don't touch the ticket at all and, and deliver directly to the customer. So tip number three, because uh, uh, there's a caveat there about that workflow, is know, know your environment. And we support 10.6 uh, and above, right? And I'm thinking 10.6, now we're at we're, uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Like, can we drop 10.6, Chad? Please. OK, please, yeah. So uh, I, would, I would like to drop 10.6, because that, that requires more code, more work. And, and the return is like, guys, just, get, just upgrade or get a new computer or something. So sometimes, because we have so many environments, we have to uh, push our clients kicking and screaming a little bit. So this, uh, just to be clear, 
this does not get rid of recon. We're still running recon. Uh, we still do that uh, every day. Uh, but if the binary, in some cases, uh, finds that it wants, uh, the process requires us to run an additional recon, it can trigger that. So, and we still store the updates in our extension attributes. So, so that's still there. And if we look at the old way versus the new way, you can see it's much more streamlined and works better for everyone. So I want to show you just a little bit about some more data proving that you really should invest in this. And when I say invest in this, uh, it may take some time, some development, some scripting, but it, it will be worth the effort. Um, and uh, I showed this slide earlier, the number of tickets that we process. And that was about 2,400% uh, you know, more tickets than the industry. And 60% of those, 60% of those tickets were submitted automatically. And I talked about the scaling problem. And I talked about how we, we dealt with that. We, we know the customer. We automate. And there's something else I didn't mention, which has been huge for us. Uh, and that's what we call inline ticketing. It used to be that if we created, let's say Time Machine as an example. Time Machine isn't working. So uh, it would generate a ticket on Monday because Time Machine's not working. Then another ticket on Tuesday because Time Machine's still not working. Then an another ticket on Wednesday. And that was way too many tickets. Um, so with inline ticketing, we create one ticket. And if the issue is still happening, we, re we update the ticket. And if the, tic if the problem goes away, then we update and solve the ticket. So now we're dealing with multiple, uh, well, one issue happening over multiple days, but update, incrementally updating the ticket. And that was, uh, I think, a, a Zendesk API update that allowed us to do that, and that was fantastic. So what this allowed us to do when we look at 2013, 2014, 2015, is grow the company and reduce our tickets dramatically. All of this combined, everything I've talked about, came together to really push down the number of tickets that we process. And uh, that allows us to now grow even more and scale more easily. And if uh, the, the light gray are the um, tickets submitted by, by our clients, and the dark gray are the automatic tickets. So you can see where it really spiked, and then we got it under control. And the other thing with notifications is you, know, you want to find that balance between annoyance and FYI. And we're constantly working on that. We want to alert a customer, but not annoy them, right? So this turned into us processing you know, up to, sometimes up to 1,200 tickets per month manually versus today, where it's only, at the worst case, you know, 400 per month. And that's been huge. So that is my presentation. I want to open it up to Q&A. And I want to say thank you again. But I do have one more thing. One more, well, one last thing, as someone famously said many times, and that is that uh, we are very close to having device information in Zendesk. And this is a, a ticket that uh, I sent to Chad, and he responded. And in fact, Chad does this with all his tickets. He never types. He doesn't know how to type. He just puts images in all his tickets. Maybe that's why we have so many tickets, now that I think about it. But uh, this was a response I got from Chad. But what I want to really show you is, We've taken that dashboard that we created, and now we're pulling it into Zendesk. So when uh, a user opens a ticket, and we find a matching device in our dashboard, we display it in line with our ticket. And that's huge, because now our support desk is working on an issue. They don't have to go to dashboard and, or the JSS and see what's going on. They can get a summary right here. And uh, it's hard to see the color here, but I've got a disk issue. It's yellow, it's not too critical, but it's filling up. And so if I need to see more information, I can just open in Dashboard. And from there, I could open in the JSS. And this is, this is not finished, so the UI is not complete. But we hope to have that out soon. And with that, I want to say thank you again. Thank you very much. Let's open it up to Q&A, please. Thank you. <laughs> Did uh, Adam Codega ever make it here? Slacker. Where is he? Okay. Do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, 
Uh, so the question is, have we done any triggers on blacklisted software? Um, this may be where I need Chad to come up and clarify, but we do uh, occasionally blacklist software, but how we do that. Uh, okay, so the question is, do we ever blacklist software and do we, what was the last part? If, oh, avoid duplicating tickets as they repeatedly try to install it. Well, I, I would say at some point we might have to just pick up the phone and say, hey, what's, what's going on here? Uh, let me explain to you why you can't you know, do that. Uh, and that's, that raises a good point. You know, uh, automation can also breed this idea that, um, hey, I can do all this with a, with a ticket. But really, at a certain point, you still need to pick up that phone, and I encourage our team to do that. You know, hey, pick up the phone, talk to the end user, the customer, sorry, the customer. <laughs> so Chad, can you answer that question about um, do we ever use these types of workflows to blacklist software? No. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, we, we continue to use the restricted software and the option to alert, and then if we see a user repeatedly trying to do that, we just reach out. Uh, we have not had a significant problem with repeat offenses. However, if the environment changed and we did, I would look to automate that instead so that it would be a single ticket and something that may be a little bit more descriptive for them. Is this on? Yeah. 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 Right on. Okay. I, I just, there's no way I just answered everyone's questions in half an hour. Uh, do I have internet here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me, let me see. You know your dashboard password? Uh, no, but uh, we have a demo. So this is publicly available? It is, it is publicly available. Uh, anyone who has a publicly accessible JSS, uh, I'm trying to move my window. Wow. Try that again. Okay, there it is. There it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah. This is tricky, though. Okay. While I'm doing this, do we, do we have another question? Oh. What's that? I don't think I'm on the internet. Yeah. Let me just see if, okay, I am, I am, yeah. Uh, I think I just can't type. Can't really see what I'm typing. Okay, I think it's gonna load here. So uh, the, the dashboard, so forgetcomputers.com or robotcloud.net will take you to a site where you can see some things like the dashboard. And I'm going to log into the dashboard demo. And this, uh, Chad did not develop this. And in fact, the, the technology is, uh, uh, what's the name of it? Does anyone, can, does anyone recognize it? I, don't, I can't think of it right now. It's mostly Ruby. Ruby on Rails, thank you, Ruby on Rails. And using the um, JSS API, which we worked with very early on when Jamf announced that. And um, basically it's, it scrapes any, like I said, any publicly available JSS. If your JSS is internal and internal only, we can't get to it. Um, but it highlights you know, problem areas and allows you to drill down and see information and if you have JSS privileges, you can jump right into the, that device in the JSS. And we have some other information like, uh, you know, linking to Apple's warranty page. Uh, Reports in. Oh yeah, over here. Whoa, whoa! If I move too quickly, I will totally lose it. Uh, and then what? And then it, you know, this machine um, looks like. It, uh, well, it's, it's maxed out. yeah, it's maxed out. 
normally I, I think this is a problem. We shouldn't be showing a link to upgrade RAM if it's maxed out, but we have a link where you can upgrade RAM. Basically, the goal here is a, a layer of intelligence, right? Not just taking the information, but presenting it in a nice, clean, easy way and, and adding some intelligence and trying to become sort of the mint.com of, of device display, if you will. Uh, so a lot of information here, you can explore that at, at any time um, online. So uh, questions, 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 questions. Is, there, is anyone awake? Question, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the slides uh, from the beginning. Some of them are small with no IT. Oh, sorry, yes. The question is, what, are, what is our typical customer like? And it really varies. They, we, we have small customers with no IT. That could be uh, five users, 10 users, up to you know, 60, 70 users, and everything in between. And then we've got the, the large corporations that uh, are basically Windows-based, and they need help with their, um, their Apple devices. So it will either be tier one support or will be tier two. They'll escalate to us. Uh, and in all cases, we really advocate to, to use our ticketing system so we can deliver the full experience. Uh, so in those situations, uh, corporations often will say, um, they'll, they'll start by saying, well, we want you to use our ticketing system. And uh, it's so complex and ugly and not very friendly, and, and we don't know how to use it. So we, we try to politely convince them, like, well, let's, let's just treat the Macs a little differently. They're different, you know. And uh, I think we've seen that in some of the talks here this week. You know, you can't shoehorn uh, a Mac into a Windows workflow, so let's treat them a little differently, and that seems to work best for everyone. Okay, I see a lot of people itching their face like they want to raise their hand. Where are they? <laughs> yeah. Oh, right there. Chad, do we have a GitHub? We have for Bender. <laughs> uh, we do have a Git. Uh, most of that information is in a private repository uh, for our own tracking. A lot of the code that we've developed is uh, essentially we consider to be proprietary. However, if you're looking to get started, I'm sure that we can give you some examples or point you to some relevant other locations. Um, but as far as taking the, the attributes that we already have, uh, there'd be quite a bit of stuff we'd have to peel out of there before it'd be comfortable uh, distributing it. Yeah, you know, the, the robot cloud product that we've developed is not really meant for this audience because you guys all run in your own JSS. It's really meant for those people who want the capabilities of the JSS but they want it plug and play, and they don't have time to, to manage it or maintain it. So, um, but, but out of that, what grew out of that are these pieces like support menu and dashboard, which we are trying to make available to uh, anyone. And um, we do have uh, pricing on our page, uh, and I like to think it's very affordable, uh, and it's tiered based on how many devices you have. Um, but if you have any questions about that, you know, let me know, please, afterward. Not now. The the slides will, will the slides be available, Chris? If you, if you would like them to be available. Okay. Well, this, the presentation will be available, right, on Jamf TV, yeah, your new channel. Yeah, this will be recorded. But yeah. Okay. I think you post all the videos, right? Yep. Yeah. Unless I said something inappropriate, then I'll. <laughs> okay. Oh okay. uh, yes. It is. Uh, the menu bar app is also a product that we've tried to make available, um, support menu. And it is on the App Store. Um, but if you want the full capabilities, talk to us directly. Um, because we still haven't, like Apple won't let us do all the things we want to do with support menu through the App Store. And uh, what's interesting is we charge 99 cents just because we thought, well, we, we, you know, we put a lot of work into this. 99 cents is not a lot of money. And we, we sell maybe, maybe one a day. Uh, but, but by a mistake of my own, I accidentally made it free for 24 hours. And the first, the first thought was, holy cow, we're selling a lot of support menu. <laughs> oh, for free. <laughs> and it was all going to China and Russia. So that was interesting. Uh, 
I don't know what triggers they have. Like when a when an app goes free, those countries just start buying it up for some reason to recreate it. Maybe I, I have no idea. Does anyone know? Um, questions? Questions? Bueller? Bueller. Yeah. Uh, do we have, yes, we do. Single org or EDU is our middle tier right there for support menu. Yeah, I know we have some um, uh, education environments using it. And the support menu, uh, also, just to mention, uh, is customizable. So, you know, the one I showed you is the one I, I use. I just screen grabbed it for this presentation, but you would customize it with, obviously, your information. We don't want you, your people contacting us, please, no. <laughs> Unless you're part of Robot Cloud or something like that. Okay. Yes. The historical data. Well, for blacklisting, or I don't. That would be. Oh, sorry. The question is if we're blacklisting an app, is that right? Which, which we, we have not really done, have we? Other than, uh, okay, okay. A repetitive problem. Uh, right, so uh, let's see, if I can think of where, uh, when we have a repetitive problem and we reach out, you know, what, through the automation process, when we're not touching anything, we are really reliant on the, on the customer to reach out to us, right? So it would be very difficult. I suppose we could script, hey, if, if we're seeing this happening multiple times within a short span, notify us. I think we've talked about that. But are we doing anything like that? Uh, yes, for uh, kernel panics. If there are too uh, many kernel panics within a certain amount of time, that'll generate another trigger that only goes to admins. Uh, as far as the uh, restricted software, uh, since that one is not part of the extension attributes, we use the jam feature. Uh, that simply just goes to our support desk, so it's always going to be a manual item. And so it'll be parsed by myself or somebody else on the team. And it's very apparent uh, in that view that you'll see, tried to launch it, tried to launch it, tried to launch it. Uh, so it uh, is a human element that makes that decision that the phone needs to be used. Um, so it's for, for restricted software, but that can be automated with just an additional layer of logic. And uh, currently, we only do that for kernel panics. Yeah. Uh, you may have answered this, but I noticed that your number of tickets have grown pretty substantially. Is that due to automation, growth, or other? I, you obviously missed the beginning of the presentation, I sir. I'm going to have to ask <laughs> you to step outside. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was getting coffee, everyone. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to say, and I, I guess I, I, have, I don't know anyone yet who's asked a question, but um, uh, maybe one of my buddies here could ask a question, and then I could say, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. Because <laughs> everyone says, great question, great question. You know, I just, anyway. Uh, the question is, our uh, you know, uh, yes, automation clearly ruined us on the, on the ticket side, and, then we, and, that, and that motivated us to fix it. And that, that's what the presentation was about. How do we get to that point of fixing this growing problem, which uh, has made it so e automation has made it so easy to do things that we really can't keep up with the results. And so, um, couldn't. yeah, couldn't yeah. keep up with the results. So. Well, that's what I'm wondering. How, how are you determining what is actually necessary and what's not, or is it all necessary in the automation? The automation, I, we like to, hey, if we can automate it, let's do it. Like anything is open for automation. We just need to f open our minds and eyes and ears and figure it out. And uh, it's just that, as I mentioned throughout the talk, you, you still have to be there for the customer in many different ways. It's just you're freeing yourself from doing those mundane tasks that you really, you know, it's not a good use of your time. You, you, you're smarter than that. You, you, you don't need to be doing that type of work. Yeah. So now that you have more tickets coming in, somebody has to actually do that. Right. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Are you seeing actually more work being done? Um, 
we're, we're seeing more, uh, the question is are we seeing more work being done and we're seeing more efficient work being done and uh, that frees us up to do more, you know, billable work or more productive work. Chad, do you uh, want to yeah, comment? Uh, just to expand on that. Uh, before, if uh, say a machine uh, had some uh, pending bad sectors or something like that, we'd get a call, my machine is slow, and what, you know, and we'd have to kind of troubleshoot it, connect or go on site. Now we can scan the blocks in advance. We'll know if a hard drive is going to be failing well before it hits the smart status stage. So we can get on top of that. Uh, I actually cannot remember the last time we've lost data because of this kind of automation. So yes, there's still work being done, but we're so far ahead of it because of the automation that you know, the, the client is happier, it takes less time to fix it. In a lot of cases, uh, we can just uh, order the new drive, install it before it goes you know, completely upside down. So yeah, the automations definitely create additional work uh, for us, but the uh, majority of the problems that occur uh, can be solved by the user uh, within the like the next steps for them, and they generally go through those next steps and say like, oh, I need to restart my machine. It's uh, you know been over 60 days or time machine. Click this button. So a lot of the work that we would have been doing manually is uh, done by the user. They are empowered to do so, but uh, only in the case of hardware are we generating additional work. But it's all beneficial. So it's but, proactive. Right? Yes, as 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 far in advance as we can. Yeah. Truly proactive, not just a word we've word. put on our website. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, so the question is uh, when we're generating uh, alerts to a customer through notification center, you know, how are we doing that? And um, just to summarize, I, this is a lot more complex than it looks, to be honest with you, and it's evolved over time, and I've simplified the story. Uh, but in that particular instance, we're generate, our support menu is periodically talking to Zendesk through the API and saying, is there anything new? Mm -hmm. And if it finds something new, then it triggers that notification center and updates support menu. Um, so th that's, how, that's how it's working. Uh, now the ticket could have been generated automatically or manually by us, by the customer. You know, it could come in many different ways. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, uh, where I mentioned uh, historical data. Where are we accessing the data? So every time uh, we create an automated notification, it's triggering a ticket in Zendesk, which is being stored indefinitely in the system. So uh, once again, it doesn't matter where the ticket comes from, it, or, or rather, it, the automation is the only time that it will have log information or serial number information, typically. You know, the customer is not so polite as to give you all the details, nor should they be required to. But the, the automation gives us the details we need. And then it's really the serial number that we track. So the serial number outside of a, you know, if it changes at the Genius Bar uh, or, or ends up with no serial number at the Genius mm. Bar, which happens sometimes. Uh, but that's really, uh, it's just a quick and easy identifier and, and in most ticketing systems, you can just search by serial number and show the history of the device. And it's really clean because uh, that's pretty much the only time um, the serial number shows up is in a notification, you know, outside of a, a, a one-off conversation where we paste it in there. We have just a couple more minutes. Did you have a question? Were you, you, you? I'm just pointing now. I'm just, someone's gonna start talking. Okay, I think we're done. Are, are we, no, question.
Yeah, so the, the comment was uh, a lot of our ideas come from our own support desk where, uh, to, be, to be blunt and honest, we start complaining about something. <laughs> like, why are we doing this, hitting our head against the wall over and over? And then we say, hey, we could automate this. Let's do that. You know? and, uh, and I say, Chad, let's do this. Let's automate. He's like, I'm busy. I don't have time to do that. <laughs> I say, stop everything and just do it. Any other questions? Okay, thanks again, everyone, and, and, and thanks for your uh, participation. Thank you.